Hey out there, welcome to episode 5 of our journey. If you've just stumbled upon our channel, I'm Erickson Steele and this is History for Couch Potatoes. Lately, I've given a lot of thought to energizing our little neck of the woods and making the channel a bit more appealing. History is all around us. It's not just names and dates, like George Washington chopping down a cherry tree, kings and queens, and political upheaval. History is made of those little moments that help shape the world that we live in. From the invention of the wheel, we all remember that day, <laughs> to those great moments in music and video games and television. And we're going to explore some of that in our ongoing attempt to bring you history that won't make you drowsy. Let's see how many times I can say history in one sitting. <laughs> Originally touted as the Woodstock Music and Arts Festival, Woodstock was to be held on a dairy farm in New York in August of 1969. Three days of peace, love, and music. Lots and lots of music is what they called it. Considering the turmoil blanketing the United States throughout the decade, people needed a chance to step back, catch their breath, and just have a good time. Michael Lang, Artie Kornfeld, Joel Rosenman, and John Roberts wanted to make that happen. You see, Roberts and Rosenman were the big money guys bankrolling the event. John Roberts would handle promotion. He gave himself a big pat on the back for having organized a prior musical extravaganza, the Miami Pop Festival, which saw the attendance of over 25,000 people. That's a lot of porta potties. <laughs> Roberts and Rosenman, both hailing from New York City, were in the midst of building a music studio when they came up with a pretty good idea of organizing a music concert full of bands that were well known around the area, like Bob Dylan. Kornfeld was quick to jump on board. Beginning in 1969, things were set in motion, and as you might suspect, the group butted heads as to how to handle it. While some were business-minded, others were cool and relaxed and never thought that they would see eye to eye. Finding a site to hold the concert was problematic at best, but the men took to the road and eventually found just the right spot. Secretly, each worried about finances and wondered whether or not they should just pull the plug on the whole thing. Credence Clearwater Revival was the first band to sign up, and for a mere $10,000, $75,000 on today's market. The promoters had a rough time convincing bands to perform, but when word spread that CCR was involved, it forced other bands to stand up and take notice. Woodstock was basically a money-making scheme meant to line the pockets of their promoters. But Roberts and Rosenman, Lang and Cornfield soon realized that they might have to let everyone in for free. It didn't look like there'd be enough time to install fences or build ticket booths. But when all hope was lost, someone had an idea. Sell tickets at neighborhood record stores or by mail from 18 to 24 dollars. It worked in a big way. 50,000 tickets had been anticipated, but nearly 200,000 were sold. Residents put a tight lid on any plans to have the concert take place in the town of Woodstock itself. They weren't going to have any part of the noise, the crowds, the massive piles of garbage, or destruction that the concert goers were bound to leave behind. That wasn't going to happen. It's often disputed as to who introduced Roberts and Rosenman to a dairy farmer in the town of Bethel, New York. But Max Yasker Land was perfect, and he relished the chance of hosting all the concert goers, even if his neighbors weren't all that pleased. Hosted all over town were petitions aimed at stopping Yasker's hippie music festival, and fearing being voted out of office. There was a back and forth between city officials, 
concerning who would issue permits for the event. While one hand was in favor, the other said no way. Taking so much time to secure a venue left little time for needed construction, especially the main attraction. In a meeting just days before the concert, construction crews wanted the four promoters to choose. Did they want all efforts to be focused on the completion of the souvenir stands, the fences, or the stage? Naturally, the men went with the stage. Without it, concert goers would have nothing to hold their attention. Pulling off this concert would be a dream come true. But by the next morning, reality set in. As groups of early attendees sat in front of a half-finished stage, without proper fencing, folks wandered into the concert ground, whether they had tickets or not. There was so much traffic that law enforcement decided to be lenient when it came to the rules of the road. And the media of the day tried their hardest to talk folks out of attending. It was quickly becoming a public safety hazard. And if that wasn't enough, Mother Nature tossed her hat into the ring, delivering a downpour of rain which brought flooded roads and a muddy concert ground. There was nowhere near enough toilets for the attendees, hardly any souvenirs. Governor Nelson Rockefeller considered calling the National Guard, but the four promoters pleaded with him not to. They wanted him to hold off and see what happens. However, it was agreed that the U.S. Air Force would escort all performers to and from the event. Jimi Hendrix was the last performer, shredding his guitar strings at 8.30 Monday morning. It's been said that over 450,000 people were in attendance, even though only half bothered to buy a ticket. Although no actual count ever took place. What's clear is that three people lost their lives. It seems a teenager looking for a place to rest his head fell asleep in a nearby hayfield and never saw the farm equipment coming. Drug use was rampant. Out of the 743 overdose cases reported, only two were fatal. But it wasn't all bad news. Rumor has it that dozens of lives began that day. At least, that's the story the proud parents told. Yet, the only confirmed birth was from a woman who'd been airlifted to the hospital. Max Yasker never lost sight of how nearly 500,000 people converged on his dairy farm, serenaded by the likes of Richie Valens, Joan Baez, Santana, The Grateful Dead, Sly and the Family Stone, Jefferson Airplane, Joe Cocker, and many others. He'd later say that it was a time to come together to look past the problems of America and hope for a brighter future. You know, it wasn't until watching The Wonder Years that I first learned about those great performers. Thanks, Fred Savage. I owe you one. <laughs> I remember buying every cassette and CD that I could get my hands on. The 60s was an awesome time for music, and there'll never be anything like it. For history that won't make you drowsy, I'm Erickson Steele. Thanks for watching History for Couch Potatoes. See ya!